So thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. And uh, the subject of the talk is, these, is the following question. So we will be, so it's, so it will be describing the properties of surfaces, n-dimensional surfaces, that comes as boundaries of subsets of some Euclidean space uh, with the property that, so we we'll make two assumptions. The first one is that the volume of the region bounded is finite. And the second assumption that is that the Minkarvashir vector scalar the normal to my surface, that's, so this scalar in curvature, so the normal to the set, sorry. So here I will have this set of finite volume with an outer unit normal. So I, I'll directly call h of omega the scalar obtained by the mean curvature vector of the surface, scalar the boundary. So this will be close to a constant. <coughs> so this will be the problem I will discuss. What can we say? When we have a surface that is a boundary of a set of finite volume, was the scalar mean curvature with respect to the outer unit normal is close to a constant. Now, uh, before I enter into describing what you can expect and what we do know and what we do not know, uh, uh, there is a, uh, I would like to give you two motivations for studying these objects. Okay, so the first motivation. comes from the theory of capillarity, in particular the study of liquid droplets in a potential field. So by a liquid droplet in a potential field, I mean that I will have this droplet of liquid uh, and uh, Okay. That lies at equilibrium, right? Under some potential field given by a potential density and potential energy density G. So this kind of uh, configuration, the energy, is described by the following kind of energy. So where p of omega will be what I call the perimeter of omega, so the area of its boundary. And uh, sigma will be the surface tension, so the units of surface tension are newton over meters, right? So that you get an energy here. And then g of x can be uh, pretty much what you prefer it to be. Okay, so it, uh, I, I would say that in the most classical setting is gravity. So it will be the density of the fluid times the acceleration of the place where you happen to be, acceleration of gravity, and uh, the coordinate in which the gravity is acting. All right, but actually there are very interesting cases where g of x is uh, a an electrostatic potential, for example. So actually, these are applications that are very important, where you have, uh, uh, where, for example, you are printing something with a printer, and you have these little droplets of liquid. So what you're seeing is actually the, the interaction with electrostatic forces are more important. Maybe. So there are various options. But let's, let's just say that so G will be some uh, potential energy density, OK? And then depending on the context, you should expect to put there something that can give you either an interesting structure to play with or just a term that you disregard and you just consider it a, some given potential. OK, so what is the relation of my problem with this setting, right? So the relation lies in the fact that the Euler-Lagrange equations for the Gauss capillarity energy so 
So the other Lagrange equation for this problem is h of omega plus g equal to lambda, a constant. So these are the Euler Lagrange equation at fixed volume. So the volume omega of our droplet, sorry, the volume m, is assumed to be fixed. Okay? So, and that's actually the reason why Gauss introduced these kind of energies, okay? to obtain those Euler Lagrange equations, sorry, to obtain this equation as uh, an Euler Lagrange equation, as a variational principle. So, um, so coming from that energy, that's the thing that is going to be true um, at every x in the boundary of omega. So now there is a very simple, nice computation you can do uh, to compute what lambda should be in terms of omega and g, right? So let me do it for you. I mean, since we have this idea that w these talks are can happen at a relaxed piece, right? It's, uh, we have only two hours, so we can afford the luxury of doing some computations, right? <laughs> and <laughs> just to fill the time. So, so the way to compute the, the computer Lagrange multiplier will be to write down the volume of omega as the integral of the divergence of the identity, uh, and then to use the divergence theorem to bring these to the boundary of omega. So remember that nu of omega for me is the outer unit normal to the set, right? And now what I'm going to do, I am going to divide and multiply by my constant quantity so that, um, so that this is equal to 1 over lambda, that is the Lagrange multiplier. And here we have the boundary of omega. And here I have h omega plus g, where there is a sigma here, uh, x scalar nu of omega. OK. So this gives me a way to compute lambda. And what I find, if I do that, so I see that lambda is equal to 1 over n plus 1, the volume of omega. And I have two terms. So the first term is the integral over the boundary of omega. So there is the sigma, OK. But then there is the integral over the boundary of omega of the Minkarvashir vector of the boundary of omega scalar x. The second term is just the integral over the boundary of omega of gx, and then there is x scalar the normal. So what happens next is that I apply the divergence theorem again. Once to go back, once to make the, tan the tangential divergence appear, and the other case to go back inside the domain. So when I do the tangential divergence theorem all along the boundary of omega, yet I get, uh, since, I have, since the boundary of omega is no boundary, I get the tangential divergence of x that is just the dimension of the surface. So this term here is just equal to the integral over the boundary of omega of the tangential divergence of x, which is n times the perimeter of omega. While this term here will give me the integral over the bulk of my liquid droplet of the standard divergence of the scalar function g of x times the vector field x. OK? So we bring everything together. We got sigma times what I will call h0 of omega. I will use it through the talk, so that's why I'm giving it a name, where this h0 of omega will exactly be n times the perimeter of the droplet divided by n plus 1, the volume of the droplet. So that's a number that has indeed the dimensions of a mean curvature, right? Because it's 1 over length. And then I have the other term I get is 1 over n plus 1, the average over omega of the divergence of the potential density times the position. OK? So that's what this Lagrange multiplier is. So that's a very classical computation eh, that uh, it's probably due to Gauss himself, as far as I know. So now that you have it, you can easily deduce that uh, um, 
A critical point for the Gauss free energy is going to have mean curvature very close to be constant, but not constant actually, just very close to be constant in terms of how large the volume of this droplet is with respect to the potential energy and the surface tension. So indeed, you see. Now, I know that lambda is that, and I have my equation, where here I got a sigma missing, of course. OK? So if you plug in lambda equal to sigma h0 omega plus the, the other thing into the equation up there, right? what we get is that, that h of omega minus h0 of omega, I'm already rearranging the terms a little bit, is equal to one of the surface tension. Then we have g of x minus the average or maybe, no, is minus g of x, plus the average of divergence of g x x. And now, that's right, OK? So now all this term here will just be, say that I am bounding these in absolute value. So all the stuff that is here will just be one of the surface tension. And then if you want here, you just have g in C1 over, say, a ball containing the droplet omega, right? Simply because this is g in C0, and this is just uh, g times position times whatever. You know, I mean, there is really nothing happening here. So as soon as g is bounded together with its derivative into the region occupied by your droplet omega, this is just going to be a constant depending on the potential energy. But the interesting aspect now is that what happens if you divide h of omega by this constant, h0 of omega? Well, what you discover is that the C0 norm along the boundary of omega of this ratio, minus 1, is less than some constant depending on the surface tension and the potential energy density times the reciprocal of uh, h0 of omega. But by the isoperimetric inequality, right, the perimeter of omega is larger than some concave power of the volume of omega. Okay? So here you have the linear power, here you have some concave power, you got some power of omega left. So here we get c n sigma g volume of omega to the power 1 over n plus 1. And the interesting thing about this formula is that the left hand side is scale invariant while the right hand side is not. Okay? And this comes from the fact that in our energy, right, if the volume is small, we expect the perimeter to go like a concave power of the volume and the potential energy to be roughly proportional to a volume. So that's why this uh, uh, difference in scaling in the energy is reflected uh, into the Euler-Lagrange equation. And ultimately tells you that if the volume of your droplet is sufficiently small, with respect to the physical parameters entering the question, then the mean curvature of your droplet is close to a constant. And it's close, you see, in a scale invariant form. OK, this is a scale invariant quantity. It doesn't depend if I scale omega. If I scale omega, I scale is h0 of omega. Actually, this is a very simple characterization of h0 omega. So it's an exercise based on the same kind of computation. If you know that h of omega is constantly equal to some number c along its boundary, then this number c has no option but being n times the perimeter of omega, n plus 1, the volume of omega. These, again, whenever you have a set of finite volume. Huh? OK? So this number h0 of omega is not there by, by chance. It's, it's there because. It's the, your only possibility. If you go back through my computation and you impose that g is equal to 0, so that I'm talking about a set with constant mean curvature, that's exactly what I have proved at the blackboard right now. That if you have constant mean curvature, the constant must be h0 of omega. And h0 of omega is exploding as the volume goes to 0 because it goes like 1 over length. It goes like at least like 1 over the volume to the power 1 over n plus 1. So I turn the thing around, and you see that in the study of capillarity droplets, sets was boundary as almost C0, almost constant mean curvature in a uniform sense are the objects you want to understand. OK? So, so that's the first motivation. 
and you uh, these uh, so so my first motivation brings me to consider sets with this quantity small, OK? OK. OK. But actually, there is uh, another important problem where you want to understand what almost constant mean curvature boundaries are doing. And the problem is, actually, it's, it's, it has nothing really to do with this zero deficit, but more with the L2 deficit, the, the L2 oscillation of the mean curvature. So I guess this is quite familiar for many of you, but <coughs> since they are making a movie out of, the, of this talk, I will explain the motivation carefully. <coughs> So, so my second motivation will be the following. So we have some family of sets, time dependent, that are moving as time goes with some velocity. And uh, OK. When you have these kind of things, you can easily compute formulas. So the variation of volume of your sets will be equal to the integral of the velocity scalar the normal at time t, right? So that's how the volume changes for a family of sets evolving through a velocity field v. While the change in perimeter, right, will be the change in perimeter will be equal to the integral along the boundary of v, uh, sorry, of v scalar the mean curvature vector of the boundary of omega t. So, and I'm particularly interested in the second formula. That is essentially the variational characterization of mean curvature, right? I mean, when you, you, take, fir you take variations of, your, uh, of a set, uh, you take the time derivative at time equal to 0, and you get that formula if v is the initial velocity of your flow. So that's really the, ba the basics of calculus of variation, what I've just written down, right? So somehow, if you ask yourself your question, among all velocities of, uh, um, so if you ask your question, so essentially this formula is telling me that uh, the differential of the perimeter, right? is given by the mean curvature vector. So if I want to take the steepest descent, I will choose v to be minus the mean curvature vector. And this will give me the flow of my sets that dissipates perimeter at the highest rate. So, so highest rate dissipation of perimeter is obtained according to these variational formulas when a v is equal to minus the mean curvature vector. And so and this is indeed the idea of the gradient flow, the gradient flow of the perimeter function. Okay, so and this gives us the indeed the mean curvature flow, right? So now the mean curvature flow it's a uh, it's, uh, of course, a, a super wide topic. But what I want to focus here is a variant of the standard mean curvature flow that would be v equal to that. That is the volume preserving version of it. So the volume preserving version of these is the situation where your velocity is still the mean curvature. But at each given time, you subtract a constant multiple of uh, the outer unit normal. So this really means that we make the boundary of the set moving, looking at the point, its point pi's mean curvature. But at, at every given, given time, we perform 
a rescaling of the set, right? Because a constant times the normal is the velocity that corresponds to a rescaling of the volume. Okay, so it's like you let it flow by mean curvature, but then you immediately you fix it so that the volume doesn't change. And indeed, if you use well, so that, so that the volume doesn't change depends on the choice of h, and of course the choice the choice of h that gives you what I'm just saying is the average of the scalar mean curvature with respect to the outer unit normal of your boundary set. So if you choose these, if this is your velocity with this dilation factor proportional to the average of the scalar mean curvature, then we get the following two informations. So for the volume preserving mean curvature flow, the time derivative of the volume is equal to 0. And the time derivative of the perimeter, okay, you just have to do the algebra. And this is really a square. okay. But what you get is that the derivative of the perimeter will be the negative of the L2 oscillation of the mean curvature. Okay? So and indeed this, this is indeed the gradient flow of the perimeter functional at fixed volume on the manifold of fixed volume uh, sets. OK, what is the, OK, this is just, this happens whatever you do to your set, right? I mean, that's not, uh, there's nothing to do in necessarily speaking with almost CMC. But actually, the way to see that uh, sets with almost constant mean curvature pops up in this setting is to do the obvious computation. Let me do it here. So the perimeter at time 0 will be larger than the perimeter at time, the integral, sorry, of between 0 and t, some given time. of this L2 oscillation. So in particular, if I can show that my flow exists for every time t, right? So if I can construct a flow that exists for arbitrary large time, then I can find sequences of time going to infinity such that, let's call it uh, omega j, OK? Omega j will be omega of tj, uh, satisfies uh, the limit as j goes to infinity of the integrals of the omega j, h of omega j minus a bunch of constants equal to 0. So in principle, if you have long time existence for the volume preserving mean curvature flows, your sets will have, uh, well, and if you can show that the average of the mean curvatures stays bounded along your sequence, so that I can replace with a number here. If I can show these two things, by compactness I mean, if I can show these two things, then uh, the large time behavior of the volume preserving mean curvature flow will be that of sequences of sets with almost constant mean curvature in L2. OK? So according to the second motivation, so the long time behavior of the volume preserving mean curvature flow calls for understanding the situation where, what do we know? So we know that the volumes of our sets are fixed, because they will be the volume of the first set. We know that the perimeter of the omega j's will be decreasing to some positive limit, right? They are decreasing because they are time slices of the volume preserving mean curvature flow, and the perimeter is decreasing along the flow. Uh, we know it's going to be positive, the positive the limit because the limit of those p of omega j's is larger than the li limit of, there will be by compactness of sets of finite perimeters, some limit. And this limit will be a positive volume. So if it has positive volume, it has positive perimeter by the isoperimetric inequality. So it's non-trivial. And we also know, and that's the information 
that h of omega j minus h j squared goes to 0, where these h j are just the averages of the, mean curvature, of the scalar mean curvatures along, along the boundary. OK. So there is actually a third motivation that uh, I, I will just tell you by, without writing it on the blackboard, because it's actually very much related to the first one. So I mean, I don't really need to start from the beginning. Uh, but it's somehow related to the first one, but it's somehow in the opposite regime, where you look at sets with very large volume. Okay. So and the problem is the following. Um, you are in the context uh, of uh, uh, general relativity. And you're looking to um, one of these model solutions uh, for the Einstein's static Einstein's equation. So you're looking at the Schwarzschild metric, uh, or the anti de Sitter metric, or some of these models, radial models, essentially. And now you are working, uh, rather than with these model objects, you are working with metrics that converge, say, to Schwarzschild with a certain rate as the radius goes to infinity. OK? So there is this uh, beautiful result, uh, very much celebrated, of uh, Wisken and Yao, where you show the existence and uniqueness of a foliation of constant mean curvature surfaces uh, at infinity. This just for, and the interesting, uh, the, the interesting part is constructing these objects and showing that there is no other way. So they are rigid. It's like there is this just nesting of spheres, in a sense, that are completely rigid. You cannot move them around. So, and one way of constructing these objects is, of course, trying to solve the isoperimetric problem for large volumes. This has been done by probably the, by uh, Metzger and uh, Eichmar. Uh, and I, I'm not sure because I, I mean, I know the literature, but I don't know it at the level of knowing everybody. So, uh, but if you look at how these theorems are proved, uh, essentially, OK, if you go for large isoperimetric sets at large volumes, we have quantitative isoperimetry that can help you. But in a sense, uh, when you don't have quantitative isoperimetry, you could still work uh, with uh, quantitative versions of this principle of almost constant mean curvature, right? Because your CMC foliation in the perturbed metric will be actually an almost CMC foliation in the non-perturbed metric. So that you can see it somehow from the other point of view. Okay, So that's another source of uh, almost constant mean curvature surfaces that uh, uh, could be uh, interesting to. And I suspect there you could work even for its stronger than C0 notions of deficit because of what you're trying to do. OK? So then, there, then I have uh, a very important remark about both my applications. OK? So here I have discussed about sets, integration by parts, and so on, without caring about the smoothness of these objects. But actually, that's a big point. Uh, the point is that both questions, I would actually like to understand them without smoothness being imposed a priori. So this is very clear in the second application, because in the second application, if you construct uh, a solution that exists for every time for a, an extrinsic culvert flow, you are doing that because you are essentially applying some uh, uh, implic implicit minimization scheme uh, or some level sets method. So you either end up with generalized solutions in the sense of viscosity or with generalized solutions in distributional sense, like Bracky flows. So this, and this has actually has been done for, for the volume preserving mean curvature flow by Munyai, Seis, and Spadaro in, in a somehow recent paper a few years ago. So you can construct a solution that exists for every time, but what is going to be this solution? It's going to be a family of sets of finite perimeter. Was, mean, was L2 mean curvatures exist uh, just uh, in the following sense. So what you know about these sets that are just sets of finite perimeters. So if you're familiar with the notion, you already know that <coughs> these sets are going to be <coughs> very wild okay, concerning their tangential. So essentially, they have, they have uh, Lipschitz tangential properties. That's all they have. But they have it in a completely non-embedded way. So it's, well. They definitely don't have second derivatives, so you definitely don't hope to have a mean curvature in a classical sense. So for a set of finite perimeter, to have the mean curvature vector will mean that you can find some vector field in, uh, in some, some vector field H that makes the tangential uh, divergence theorem true against every test vector field. Of course, if you're smooth, this is the standard mean curvature vector. If you're not, that's your assumption. You say, OK, as much as you do sub functions, you ask for an L2 vector field that acts like a gradient in this formula. 
That's for uh, sets of finite perimeter. So you can construct a solution of the volume preserving mean curvature flow among sets of finite perimeter. And these guys uh, will have, uh, for almost every time, they will have a mean curvature vector in L2. So this is doable. But uh, this also means that if I want uh, my answer to this question to be meaningful for these problems, I need somehow to work in a very low regularity setting. Okay? And if you want, the same is for the first motivation. In general, for example, if I show the existence of a local minima of a global minimizer for this problem, or, or a local minimizer, uh, the minimizer will be a set of finite perimeter whose boundary is uh, smooth, uh, as smooth as the potential allows it to be, outside of a set of uh, large codimension. But still, it's not going to be a smooth set. Okay? So probably this C0 should have better be an L infinity. Okay? And this h omega should have better be my uh, distribution on mean curvature over there. Okay? And this lack of smoothness is really a big part of the story. So should I stop for five minutes and then we resume? What's the deal? Because now it's four or five, right? OK, good. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was rushing through these. OK, no, no, no. Yeah. But I still have a lot of pages, eh? so we can go on forever. So. OK, OK. OK, so good. <coughs> okay, so now let me tell you something about uh, um, So I think I told you all I want to say, yes, about this part here, right? So okay, so hopefully this is well motivated. Now let me tell you what we know about the constant mean curvature case, and of course is the theorem of Alexandrov. So this is somehow it's part two, it's after the motivations, is Alexandrov theorem. So uh, Alexandrov theorem tells you that essentially you just have one CMC uh, boundary of finite bounding a finite volume, that is the sphere. So this tells me that if I have the bounded of omega is, say, C2, and I can relax this, uh, if omega has finite volume, and uh, okay, if you want to say omega connected, just to avoid the trivialities, to, to these joint spheres are not so interesting, so let's say connected, and h of omega is constant, then omega is a ball. Of course, of radius, uh, what is that? N over lambda. So, um, so what is the proof uh, of Alexandrov theorem, and why is the smoothness important in it? So I'm stressing this just to give you a feeling of uh, uh, when you would later see results where smoothness is not present, you can track back a point where having smoothness. Uh, it's important, okay? So the proof goes as follows. So first of all, you know that the mean curvature is constant. And so as I told you, you know that lambda is n times the perimeter over n plus 1 the volume. And this tells you automatically that just by the fact that your set is finite volume, it has finite perimeter. <coughs> The second, so this doesn't follow by the azeopermetric inequality because it goes the opposite way, right? So then the second thing is that by, uh, by testing uh, the mean curvature condition with, uh, with vector fields that are essentially the, the identity times the characteristic of a ball, you prove the monotonicity formula. And you discover that the amount of area that uh, your boundary puts in any given ball of radius rho is increasing, provided uh, you, so this is an increasing function on rho positive, provided you give it a little help with an exponential. So if you multiply by the exponential of the constant that is the constant in curvature, there is enough steam to make this function increasing. And of course, what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that <coughs> the amount of area 
that uh, my boundary is putting in a ball of radius rho is bounded from below by a universal constant times rho to the n, wherever rho is below a certain threshold that just depends on the bound on the mean curvature. So I just have to bound from above e to the minus lambda r. And then I, I get the, a uniform lower bound. So whenever I fix a ball of radius rho for rho up to a certain amount, I am sure that there will be a, a certain given amount of area. And then if you combine these with finite perimeter, so the total area is finite, this tells you that omega is bounded. Right? If it's unbounded, I can put many of these balls and eventually we'll have infinite perimeter. Okay? And then you have the part of the argument where, so uh, Alexander's theorem, 1962, is stated with omega bounded, okay? So the reason why I'm telling you these two things is because they match better with uh, my version of Alexander's theorem that I will give you in a moment. So it makes the comparison between the two theorems easier. Um, okay, so once you know that the set is bounded, you have these, uh, uh, you have these, uh, uh, or maybe I should leave it so that you have space for looking at it, and I can do this up here. Okay. okay. So once you know the set is bounded, you have this uh, the idea that is really characteristic of this paper of Alexandrov. It is just the moving planes method, so you have your set omega, and you pick a direction, and you start moving the plane until you touch the thing. And now since the set is smooth, and this is the point where smoothness really enters into the game, it's not because it's not much uh, anywhere else, but really here. So you know that uh, once it touch, then for a very short time, the reflected surface, so let me put a coordinate maybe here, let me call it x1, let's call this parameter t, and let's call sigma t the reflection of the part of the boundary that was lying here, I reflect it there, right? So, let's denote it in yellow. So, since I have this embeddedness, I can show that sigma t is actually contained in the whole set, at least for small t. And this gets me started until I move, I move, I touch it somewhere else, right? So, until there is, a, say, a critical position t star, now the picture will never be... So let me reverse engineer the right-hand side of my set, okay? So here I... in yellow. This will be so beautiful. To watch back at home. No. <laughs> and say this was my set omega, okay? So this will be sigma of the star. And I will stop when I touch this guy the first time. And then... What Alexandrov, the idea is that you look at this cylinder where you have just two surfaces that are smooth. So they, they will have a common scale of graphicality. So you just take this cylinder, you turn it upside down. So this is my cylinder. This is the disk, that is the cross section of the cylinder. And essentially, I will have two ordered solutions of the same quasi linear elliptic equation. Okay? So V and U. And they're such that. Uh, V is equal to U at the center P of my disk. V is larger than U on the disk. And they both solve minus divergence of grad V over square root of blah, 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 equal to lambda. So by a strong maximal principle, they agree. And then you have shown that your set is symmetric. OK? Since you can do this from every direction, the set is a sphere. So. <coughs> Let me just check what I want to say next. OK, yeah. So there are two things. So this theorem is sharp in two directions. So the first direction in which it is sharp is that you really need the volume to be finite. And this is very simple, because the cylinders have constant mean curvature, right? Onduloids have constant mean curvature. And there are actually many others. So there are these capuleias the surfaces that kind of uh, uh, they're sort of uh, arrangement of spheres in R3 along a plane. And they're all connected by little necks. 
Um, and actually, you can even do crazier things. You can do like uh, three half lines of, uh, of onduloids. So you get three onduloids, you cut them in half. So it's like a half line onduloid. And then you find a way to match them around some given ball. So uh, honestly, I don't know. How much do we know about uh, infinite volume CMCs, say, inner tree? Okay, I have the impression it's a very rich uh, problem. But for example, can you, can you really do, I don't know, what kind of topologies you can do attaching these uh, necklaces of spheres or, uh, I mean, since, uh, but definitely so, this omega finite volume is uh, needed to have such a simple conclusion. And the other thing is that uh, you need uh, the surface to be embedded. So this is a bit, you see, if I have a boundary, a surface with a boundary that is embedded, it will be the boundary of a set, right? So it's a bit written in a strange way, in my theorem. But what I'm really saying is that if I have an embedded CMC surface, it's go uh, bounding a finite volume, it's going to have to be the sphere, right? But actually, there is a super famous example of uh, Vente that, uh, OK, the way it looks, honestly, you have to check it uh, with your cell phone, but uh, on the internet. But it looks something like that. It's, so it's, it's really like uh, three spheres, and somehow they are, they are interconnected, so that the whole thing is, OK, this has constant mean curvature in distributional sense, OK? But the example is not that stupid, OK? So it's really, it's really a, a map, uh, an embedding of, uh, of uh, a square with, boundary, with periodic boundary conditions into a tree, and this embedding is constant mean curvature. So it's a more uh, interesting thing than just intersecting three spheres. So, and it shows you that if it, uh, you need the assumption, some, that there is something in the fact that I'm saying that I embedded that it's preventing uh, the theorem to be false. Okay, have a question? Yeah. No, okay. So this is just immersed, no. Sorry? It's not embedded, exactly, exactly. It's an immersed example. Okay, so, OK, so I think that so a point of interest, I think, of Alexander's theorem is uh, thinking, it, thinking about it as a convexity property of the perimeter at fixed volume. Because somehow it's telling you that the only critical point happens to be the global minimizer of your energy, which is exactly the best property of convex functions at times, right? I mean, you, you don't have to worry about being uh, uh, more solutions of your other Lagrange equation than just the global minimizer. So it makes them particularly simple. And somehow the Alexander theorem may give you the impression that the isoperimetric problem has exactly this property. Its only critical point is actually the only global minimizer, modulo translations and, uh, and uh, rotations, possibly, is that it's, it's, you just have the sphere. So it's a very simple situation. You can imagine that the uh, isoperimetric profile is some paraboloid uh, with this uh, minimizer. But uh, uh, you can easily cook up examples showing you that this is not the case. And the way of doing that is really looking at the onduloids. So say that, so let's solve h of omega equal to 1. OK, so a solution is the cylinder of uh, radius 1. So I am in R3 here. And then another solution is the sphere of radius 2 because the curvatures will be one half and, a one, and one half, and so they adapt to one. And then you can actually construct the onduloids that I've already mentioned, will just give me, for every number between one and two, if I uh, shoot with uh, zero derivative my, the constant in curvature of the E, right, equal to one, I get something that will look like this. And then it will go, up. And then essentially just have to repeat itself. So this is a surface with a period t. So t equal to plus infinity, you converge the cylinder, and as t goes to, I would say, 2 and 2 is 4. So from 4 to the right, you get spheres. You get a sort of 
infinite uh, string of spheres, infinite string of spheres. So, and these have constant mean curvature, and it's crucial that they are unbounded, right? Because otherwise they would violate Alexander theorem. So now what you can do is, for example, you can take some uh, number t very close to, say that here I'm taking some tj very close to 4. At 4 I got two tangent spheres, so of radius 2. And then I do my best to close it. Okay, of course I cannot close it so that I keep the Minkarvashur equal to 1, because otherwise I am violating Alexander's theorem and I have just proved it. So, But I can do this, so let's call omega j the set. I can close it with omega j minus 1. Let's call this delta j. I can close it with having delta j going to 0 if at the same time I let this tj goes to 4 from the right. So when, whenever I do this construction, if I start from a sufficiently spheric, almost spherical onduloid, I can close it with a lower and lower cost. Okay? So this gives me a sequence of surfaces that falls under the setting of my first motivation, right? Because they will be uniformly uh, almost constant uh, mean curvature converging not to a sphere, actually, but to two spheres, or actually any number of tangent spheres, of course. Okay? So this example tells you that uh, the isoperimetric profile, sorry, the perimeter function at fixed volume, more than looking like a convex function, it looks like something that starts with a very stable uh, global minimum, okay? And then, it behaves like uh, e to the minus x in a lot of directions because it's like it has critical points but at infinity. So e to the minus x has derivative that goes to zero at infinity, right? So I would say that the, so if you want to draw a picture of the isoperimetric profile, so here these are the sets omega with volume equal to the unit ball. Um, no. Here, sorry, here I'm working with the sets was h0 of omega, that is n perimeter over n plus 1 volume equal to n. That would be, n would be for me the mean curvature of the unit ball, okay? So if I, look in the, if I work in this space where I have, of course I've taken everything modulo rotations and translations to avoid the trivialities, okay? Here I have the global minimizer, so this is B1. B1 is the global minimizer, and here there is the perimeter of B1. But, uh, and actually, if these are the smooth sets, I don't see any other critical points. So this would be the isoperimetric profile, okay? But actually, if I look at the energy level of two balls of radius 1, I have just proved that actually my isoperimetric, the perimeter function is such that in this direction, at least, there are ways of converging to twice the perimeter of the unit ball with smaller and smaller derivative of the energy. And I, I will be able to do the same for every energy level. Okay, so the isoperimetric profile definitely it has direction where it goes to infinity, but it also has a lot of directions where actually you converge to higher energy level with a zero derivative, almost zero derivative. So, so these critical points at infinity are actually pretty silly because they're just a union of tangent spheres, right? So uh, they're just at infinity because I'm working with this uh, smooth notion of sets. So I want my sets to be a boundary that is locally the graph, uh, the epigraph of a function, but why? You know, th there is of course no reason for doing that. So, uh, in a sense, the picture of Alexander's theorem is that you're missing a lot of critical points just because you are working in, uh, on the rational numbers. Okay, you should work on the real numbers and then you can find all the critical points. That's a bit the, <laughs> the analogy if you want. Okay? So, okay. 
Okay, so now I would probably uh, clean everything and start stating uh, the uh, theorems that we can prove about this problem. Or maybe since it's 425, I can clean the blackboard while you get your rest and then I can state the theorem and tell you about them, okay? And uh, actually it's funny because we start from the newest one because it's in a sense, is <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the way that the story is better told. And uh, the, the theorem that uh, started me on this problem will come as the last one. Okay, so the first theorem is what we have called the Alexandrov's theorem revisited. It tells you that, uh, uh, so among sets of finite perimeter and volume, uh, with constant curvature, so for a set of finite perimeter, this means that the integral along the reduced boundary, I will tell you in a second what is the reduced boundary in case you're not familiar, is proportional is proportional to the first variation of perimeter is proportional to the first variation of volume. That's what it means. So lambda is a constant here. So among sets of finite perimeter of finite volume and constant mean curvature, um, you just see finite union of balls. Finite union of balls, they will have radius n over lambda and they will be disjoint. So, uh, so this tells you that, so first of all, this is uh, a paper I have done with, uh, together with Matthias Delgadino and uh, with a postdoc at Imperial College right now. So, and this theorem tells you that uh, the only critical point in the, in the natural space for the energy, okay, is uh, what you would expect. So the finite union of balls. So why I'm saying the, the, na the natural space for the energy? Because let me remind you, uh, just in this, uh, just for half blackboard, what it is about sets of finite perimeter. Okay. So just to give an idea for those that are not super familiar with GMT, uh, why this is, in a sense, a natural class to consider this problem in, and not just uh, you know I mean eh, and the thing I like because I come from Italy and so I like sets of finite perimeter. So. So consider the following problem. You define the perimeter of, consider the problem of defining what is the perimeter of something, right? And, uh, okay, so. So Henry LeBeg has been long dead, but he told us how to do these things, right? You take your energy on the sets where you believe it's well-defined and you do relaxation. So here, so what LeBeg has taught us is that you should take smooth sets that converge, say, in L1 to your limit set omega. So this means that the symmetric difference between the two sets goes to zero. And that's it. So you just take the area of the boundary of your smooth set as defined elementarily, like, I don't know, the way you prefer. And then you look at all the possible sequences of sets, smooth sets approximating your limit set omega. And you just took the, the inf of the limit of the possible areas converging there, right? So this is definitely the natural definition of perimeter from the variational viewpoint. And actually, this definition is dual to the divergence theorem in the sense that the perimeter of such a set will also be the same thing. It's not only an if, it's also a sup. Is the supremum over the divergence of vector fields that are compactly supported in Rn plus 1 and takes values in the unit ball, right? Because on a smooth set, will be, this will be the integral over the boundary of omega of, of x scalar the normal. 
which is less than the perimeter if x is unit uh, length at most. So you got the right inequality. So, and the set is finite perimeter in the sense of Cacciopoli and De Giorgi if this number is finite. Okay, at this level, this is just a silly game because it's just a definition that may have absolutely no meaning, right? Because it could be that sets of finite perimeter have absolutely no geometric properties, and so you have en ended up with a definition that it's too complicated to be useful, okay? So, on the other hand, uh, this is exactly what you do for passing from smooth function to Sobolev functions, right? So this probably tells you that there is some meat here that you can eat, OK? And uh, the, the way it goes is actually that sets of finite perimeter has a lot of good properties in the sense that you can look at something called the reduced boundary. That is what is appearing in my definition of constant mean curvature. So that's why I want to explain what it is. So what is called the reduced boundary. So the word reduce tells you that the reduced boundary is in general a subset of the topological boundary. So that's why the word reduce means just smaller. And uh, the topological boundary, of course, you can mess with the topological boundary all day long, right? Because the property of converging in N1 to the set omega is not touched if I just add all the rational numbers to my set omega. I mean, it's doing nothing to it, right? So, and even here, if I change omega on a set of measure 0, no one realizes. So the, the topological boundary, as far as I'm telling you, it could be the whole space, OK? But uh, still, this, there is this object called the reduced boundary. And uh, actually, you have sets of finite perimeter where the topological boundary, no matter how, ma how many points you take out, will always have positive Lebesgue measure, OK? Still, the set will have a finite perimeter. Still, this reduced boundary that is, roughly speaking, the set of the points in the space such that if you take your set omega and you blow it up around uh, the point x, so you subtract x and you divide by, by a small row, then this thing is converging in L1 to a half space. So the L space uh, of those y's such that y nu omega x is negative. So this is almost the definition, eh? but it's the real definition is Hn equivalent to that. Okay, so are the points essentially where your set is blowing up null space. So the reduced boundary uh, will be a good object because, for example, it makes uh, the divergence theorem true. So you can really do the divergence theorem on a set of finite perimeter using the Hausdorff measure here, the reduced boundary there, and this vector nu of omega, which existence you are assuming. Okay? So the good part of it is, for example, you have, the, you, have the, you have the tangential divergence theorem as much as you would have in the smooth case. Uh, and uh, you also have the possibility of doing things like a tangential divergence. Okay, which is just the trace of the gradient of x along some n plane. So it means that you, to, 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 in order to be able to do that, I'm somehow claiming that the reduced boundary has a tangent plane, like an n-dimensional surface. And this will just be true in the sense of geometric measure theory. So the, 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 the point of the story is that uh, the reduced boundary is going to be uh, a locally HN rectifiable set. Okay, so the reduced boundary will be contained modulo a set of area 0 into an at most countable union of compact sets. And these compact sets, in turn, will be contained into some C1 surfaces uh, SJ. OK? And uh, if we take the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure, and we consider it over the blow-ups of the reduced boundary, this will converge as Radon measures to the, to the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure restricted to the orthogonal to the outer unit normal. So that's in which the sense in which we have a tangent plane. So what this esoteric thing means, if you're not familiar, it just means that whenever I take a test function phi, and I integrate it over 
the blow up of my reduced boundary, the limit, is like integrating phi along the n plane nu omega x perpendicular. So that's what it means. In, in this sense, you have this tangent plane. So once you have a tangent plane, you can make sense of the tangential divergence, and you can tell me this guy is constant in All right? And then there is uh, a famous theorem of the Georgi tells, telling you that the perimeter of a set of finite perimeter is larger than the perimeter of any ball with the same volume as your set with equality if and only if your set is a ball. And this, of course, modulo Lebesgue measure. So the Georgi's theorem tells you that there's a perimetric inequality, the perimetric theorem holds in the class of sets of finite perimeter, and you don't get anything strange because you're doing these on a class of relaxed surface. You still, still get just the ball, all right? So from this point of view, this revised, the revised Alexandrov theorem tells you that um, brings you the George's theorem. So I, 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 as, a, as a student, I was always perplexed about this mismatch between the Alexandrov theorem from 1962 and the George's theorem from 1954. All right? So the George's theorem tells you that among all sets of finite perimeter, there is only one global minimizer. And then you have this funny theorem of Alexandrov that tells you what to expect. Among critical points, you still just have balls, but uh, they must be smooth. OK? So, and then later, I mean, you, you learn a bit more of things, and you discover that, OK, but uh, say that I have an open set whose boundary can be written locally as the graph of a continuous function that, in the viscosity sense, has constant mean curvature. Then Alexandrov theorem holds, of course, because in that case, you have the regularity theory telling you that it's smooth. So you just apply, but, but you see, I can do Alexandrov theorem in higher generality, but I can do it, uh, say, using the theory of viscosity solutions. I can do that, but I need to say that locally I am the graph of a function. And that's exactly what uh, is not happening in the Georges theorem, in the Georges isoperimetric theorem. I'm just telling you that there is no a priori assumptions on the local structure of the set, but this rectifiability of the boundary. But there is nothing like. Uh, at a lot of points, I can see my look at my set, and I see the graph of a function. Okay, so that's nothing like that. So, and uh, from this, and that's why I was interested in this question. So, uh, how to put the Alexander theorem uh, in the context where it should have been true? But uh, okay, but these are more like uh, questions in aesthetics and uh, justice in mathematics, right? So you expect the theorem, you would like to see it to be true, to be true. But then maybe. <laughs> Sorry, in case, yeah. We know the regularity. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, up to a set of co-dimension, blah, blah, blah. But then this, the Georgi proved this in 54, well before proving the epsilon regularity theory in 1960. And essentially does that directly. So you, you show that Steiner symmetry, it shows that Steiner symmetrization decreases the perimeter of a set, the, that okay, perimeter. It's mm -hmm. Finite volume is the key, I think. Finite volume is the key, if, yeah. It's a, OK, it's written a bit implicitly here when I tell you that I have a ball of the same volume as the set. Yes. <coughs> yes? So in the conclusion of your theorem, do you allow to have a balls which are like a, they are not disjoint, but they, like a, they touch at one single point? Yes, that's possible, but they cannot overlap. They cannot overlap. Exactly. So what um, distinguish from like touch at one point and from overlapping? So well, Tangent at one point, uh, you see, w once you know that there are the joint spheres possible, ta tangent at one point is not disturbing at all that thing over there. Because, it, so, touching at one point uh, doesn't disturb at all uh, this uh, distribution of curvature condition, because it's just one point. You don't see it in the integrals, right? So, instead, you can easily see uh, that, uh, <coughs> uh, so, let me think about what I want to say. Uh, so, OK, instead, if you see two spheres that are overlapping as the boundary of a set, mm -hmm. yeah. a, in one piece, you're giving me the opposite sign. Mm -hmm. So it's not constant mean curvature. Of course, two, two intersecting spheres are very false, in the sense of very false, have constant mean curvature. But the theorem is false, my theorem is false among very false because of venti torus. So if you take venti torus, you just look at the image of the immersion. Okay, 
So this image of this immersion is definitely a rectifiable set by far. I mean, it's super regular as a manifold, okay? And it has constant mean curvature. And it's not even a finite union of spheres just arranged in a bad way, okay? So somehow, the example of Vente really tells you that the, assumptions of, the assumption of being a set of finite perimeter is hiding uh, into itself the notion of being embedded. So it's not a boundary of some... Exactly, parameter. exactly. If you take Venti's torus and you look at the regions it bounds, and you decide this is region 1, 1, 1, and I take this as the exterior, it won't have constant mean curvature, scalar constant mean curvature with respect to the outer region normal. Some, in some places, it will jump to the opposite value. All right, makes sense, right? So, uh, and, and my takeaway is that here, verifolds are like the immersed CMC, and sets of finite perimeter are like the embedded CMC. So a way to say that the verifold is embedded could be that locally, the support of your verifold is the set of finite perimeter, OK? Is inside the boundary of a set of finite perimeter. This could be a way of understanding embeddedness for verifolds somehow. So from this point of view, understanding the regularity of verifolds that comes as support of sets of finite perimeter would seem to me, in a sense, in, in, in a, a natural setting for understanding uh, the regularity of verifolds. Don't you think uh, Nishan could be interesting, maybe? You also have a really high multiplicity, I guess, if you go, if you go to exactly. Multiplicity, whereas the Georgia's theory tells you multiplicity is one over almost everywhere. Yes, yes. So but in a sense, it's a yeah. setting where multiplicity one, uh, pieces of sets of finite perimeter, in a, se in a setting where a lot of difficulties characteristic of variables disappear. But in a sense, it's a class on its own. Because I mean, it's how you construct local minimizers for energies. So it could be how you construct uh, uh, interesting critical points. So that's my, this is uh, more philosophy than, uh, than, <laughs> than anything else. So <coughs> OK, this is the first theorem. And why is this related to my uh, question? Because it immediately gives you a rather strong compactness theorem for almost constant mean curvature sets. So for example, a corollary of uh, this revised Alexandrov is that if you pick a sequence omega j of sets of finite perimeters, and you, you have to assume various things. So say that you know that these sets converge in L1 to some limit set. Um, and uh, of course, the limit set has finite volume eh, in this. And you know that the perimeters of the omega j's converge to the perimeter of omega. This is an assumption that doesn't uh, make me crazy. And I think you, you could remove it. Uh, in general, you know that this perimeter will be larger in the limit than the perimeter of the limit. And if you know, so these things, so if uh, for every vector field, uh, the limit as j goes to infinity of the integral over the reduced boundary of omega j of the tangential divergence of x minus lambda x scalar nu of omega j is equal to 0, then the limit set omega is a union, actually a finite union, of spheres of balls. This joint of radius n over lambda. So here I am sending the curvature to a constant in the absolutely weakest possible sense. So I'm not even telling you that the convergence must be uniform in the vector fields. I'm just telling you, pick a vector field, try to check if the mean curvature is constant, and the error relatively to that specific vector field is going to 0. Cannot be weaker than that. Okay? But there is a price, and the price that I'm paying here is that I'm giving you an assumption that uh, it's not uh, fantastic, OK? Because I am telling you something that a priori, I think the theorem is true without that assumption. So you don't have counterexample. So what could happen is that there are mul pieces of these boundaries that closes up and create multiplicity two pieces in the limit. Uh, no, we don't believe it, OK? So it shouldn't be like that, OK? So in the sense, we expect the theorem to be true without this. But it's true that I'm using a super, super uh, weak notion of almost a CMC. And this theorem, I think it's interesting in relation with my second motivation. Because the omega j's in the corollary are sets of finite perimeter. They're not smooth sets at all. Okay? So in a sense, it's a, it's a theorem that is plug and play ready for trying to address the 
long time behavior of the volume preserving mean Carvajal flow. Okay? <coughs> I mean, and I would say that probably in that setting, uh, checking these assumptions, that it doesn't seem uh, foolish. Eh? Actually, if you look at how you prove, for example, for the Yamabe flow, the existence of, uh, of the limit, uh, you pass exactly to things like that. You show that there cannot be bubbling, and so the perimeter goes to the minimal perimeter available, and stuff like that. So it's not that when you study a parabolic equation, this kind of estimate is, is incredible. So <coughs> OK, this will be the corollary. Then the second theorem, so right now I'm just giving you the statements of the theorem. Then I will tell you something more about how you prove this Alexander theorem revisited. But uh, so this is just uh, this first corollary. Then there is a second theorem. Let me write it up here. That uh, in a sense interpolates between this Alexander of theorem revisited and uh, the last result I will tell you about. Uh, that uh, was obtained again with Delgadino, with Cornelia Mihaila was a PhD student at uh, UT Austin and now is at the uh, University of Chicago as a postdoc. And uh, with uh, Robin here. So, so, and this theorem is part of a much more uh, uh, broader question that Robin will tell you about. So I will just really tell you uh, the, the um, I will just really tell you how what we prove in that paper relates to the question over there. But it's part of a more general thing. So from the point of view that I have adopted here of what is the compactness, what is contained in this paper is the following statement. So you have a bunch of boundaries that are smooth. You have normalized them by scaling so that if they converge to a constant in curvature set, that will be the unit ball. Okay, so that's the scaling that fixes the unit ball as the only possible limit. You are assuming that the mean curvatures of this set are uniformly positive. So these are going to be uniformly mean convex sets. This is a bit strange, because it would be OK for the mean curvature flow that uh, preserves mean convexity. But it's uh, a bit uh, hard to say what happens in the volume preserving mean curvature flow. But still, I mean, it's an assumption we need. That's why I have to put it. Um, then. Uh, you assume a uniform bounds on the perimeters. And let me express it like uh, these guys will have at most uh, the perimeter of L many unit balls plus 1 half. So I don't allow it to converge to more than L many unit balls. And finally, you know that H of omega j minus n in L2 goes to 0. OK. Then the conclusion is that up to subsequences, you converge to omega. And omega is the union of, at most, L many unit balls. Of course, disjoint. OK. So the interest of this second theory is that uh, with respect to the previous one, right? The big uh, difference is that I'm not giving you this convergence of the perimeters. So I mean, here in this corollary, I'm a bit masochistic, OK? Because I'm working with a really a super weak notion of almost CMC. But what we are telling you in this theorem is that as soon as you get something more reasonable, like the L2 deficit, uh, you, can get, uh, you can get rid of this uh, assumption. And in a sense, it's interesting because uh, uh, the, the L2 deficit is not enough to use Allard regularity. Okay? So the L2 deficit is not enough uh, to say a priori that local bounds on the area tells you, gives you local graphicality scales that are uniform. So it's still a deficit that is rough enough uh, to make a lot of bad things possible, and still they are not happening. Okay. But as I said, I mean, this has a broader context, that is the result. It's related to, uh, to, another, uh, <coughs> to another very much open question. So uh, you may hear more about it. 
So, and then there is a, the third theorem in the series. There's actually the first theorem that comes in order of time. And these I have proved with Giulio Ciraulo, who is in Palermo. And uh, so, and in this theorem, it's, it's really a theorem that uh, we uh, we proved uh, having in mind the first motivation. So it will be a theorem with the C0 deficit. Okay. So here we have a smooth set. So as usual, normalized, so that unit balls will be the reference uh, geometry. Um, the perimeter of this set will again just allow me to see at most L of these balls. Uh, OK, so and then I will look at the C0 oscillation of the Minkarov, Com calling it delta of omega to make it quicker to write things down. OK, so under these assumptions, the theorem tells me that these uh, Delta of omega at some power alpha. So alpha will be typically order of one over the dimension. So this delta of omega controls a lot of things. So first of all, it controls the L1 distance of the set omega from, so controls modulo a constant depending on n, L, controls the distance of omega from G, where G is a finite union of L many balls, uh, radius 1, and mutually tangent. So since I'm working with this zero deficit, I am not allowing, OK, omega is connected. Maybe I should have said it here. So I'm just focusing on one piece. But it's not like that in the bubbling, I can make tentacles that disappear in the limit and give me disconnected balls. So the C0 deficit is forcing the balls to touch. Okay. So in, with the L2 deficit, uh, in dimension at least 4 or greater in ambient space, you can, do the, you can do tentacles that are long. So that's a bit, uh, while with the C0 deficit, you cannot. Uh, and in particular, I can control in the same way the Hausdorff distance that in my personal notation is called HD. So the Hausdorff distance of the boundary of omega from the boundary of G will also be controlled by some power of this C0 oscillation. Uh, as well as the total perimeter of omega minus L times, uh, well, OK, let me call it cardinality of G. So the number of the balls, the perimeter of B1. So both quant quantities are going to be both the Hausdorff distance and the, and the total perimeter are going to be close to what they should be for the family of balls. So let me maybe draw a picture. So if these are the two balls, tangent balls given by the set G, and this is my set omega, right? So the Hausdorff distance between the boundaries really tell me that the two boundaries are trapped in small neighborhoods of, the, of one or the other. Uh, the total perimeter of this omega will be very close to twice the perimeter of the ball of unit 1. The, L1, the, the, the distance in volume is going to be controlled by that, uh, by that thing. But then you can prove more. You can actually show that if you take out uh, to, uh, so say that you take a tangency point, and you just go there and take out some set sigma. Sigma stands for union of spherical caps. Okay, So at each tangency point, I carve out two opposite spherical caps. And I call sigma the set of all the spherical caps that I'm taking out with this recipe. Okay, so. The diameter 
of sigma, so sigma are just uh, spherical pairs of union of all the pairs of spherical caps, okay? Uh, pairs of, say, in some, in some sense, opposite spherical caps. So, and for each tangency point, I take out this spherical cap and the other spherical cap. So the spherical caps I have to take out in my construction will be small, okay? So the, the balls, the limit balls are mutually tangent, and the omegas are set connected sets. So here what I expect to have is some sort of neck, right? And what I'm telling you is, if you take out these uh, sigmas, then there exists, uh, so my delta of omega controls the C1 alpha norm along the boundary of G minus the union of the spherical caps of a function psi with the property that if I do identity plus psi, the normal to G, and I apply this to the boundary of G minus sigma, this is contained in the boundary of omega. So I'm telling you that there is a huge, a huge surface, actually, that is a graph over G minus the small spherical caps. And this huge surface is actually a normal graph contained in the boundary of omega. So a lot of the boundary of omega, so the boundary of omega contains this large surface. Here is this function psi of x, if this is the point x on the boundary of G. And by doing this normal uh, deformation with psi of x, I have this. It's large because the sigma is small, right? And actually, if you ask yourself, OK, how much area is in the region that is left out by this normal graph? Very little. So hn of the boundary of omega minus identity minus my normal graph over the boundary of g minus the caps, this is also controlled by delta of omega to the alpha. Okay? So it's like 99% uh, of the boundary of omega is a normal graph over the two spheres. Of course, I cannot, uh, I cannot push this graphicality property until the tangency point, okay? because there is a topological problem okay? in, in talking about normal graphs. So when you say mutual tangent, you mean that any two spheres are tangent? Or well, OK. Yeah, yeah, I could have 500 spheres, right? It depends on L. So here I just draw a picture with L equal to 2. Yes, that, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah, exactly, that's the point. That's what is left uh, after you take the limit of the assumption that the omega was connected. That was this, wha how this set remembers through the C0 deficit that you were connected. And uh, probably it's, uh, I would say, C2 something. But is, uh, so this is a good question because I, I don't believe it, you know, I mean, I don't think you need the regularity to do these things. So it's uh, more in the, in the way we prove things, probably, then in the way it, it really is. And uh, you can see this a lot, I think. And I became more and more convinced about this after I did this uh, Alexandrov theorem, revisited, because somehow it tells you that uh, having almost constant mean curvature is a rather strong assumption on your sets of finite perimeters. So it's not clear also that. I think it's, uh, it's am I right in understanding that this is somehow a local version of this? Even if it is a set of five hundred perimeter, you, you could you could have singularities also. The, the, if you take a piece of a um, set of five perimeters. Mm -hmm. In principle, you may have singularity. singularity. In a sense, a posteriori, what all this business is telling you, if you have a set of finite perimeter with mean curvature in LP for P larger than the surface dimension, then uh, the singular set should be just isolated points. Why? Because you must be close uh, to a union spheres, and so you can transfer the excess information from the union spheres to, the, to, the, to your sets of finite perimeter. It's a bit in the compactness, right? You have a, you have a limit that is smooth, but for right, finite perimeter. But, but okay. assume that you are finite volume, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of right. this is infinite volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, then that yes. Even if it's a fine set of finite perimeter without finite volume, Locally, locally fine, I guess. That, that, that could still could happen. You can ah, ah, yeah, 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 OK. You could still, yes, I, 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 would, I agree with you. Yes, I would expect that. 
So, okay, it's not totally, it's not obvious at all. So if you prove it, I think it's a very nice thing because, I mean, it's not obvious at all. If here you're seeing this very simple singular set uh, because, uh, you know, you because, know somehow, because just comes from the global information. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. For you, I guess the regularity is a, is a, is a consequence. Yes, yes. But, but you could try to, I, I totally agree with you, you could try to go the other way around and you would expect better yeah, regularity. Unless you have stability or something, you, you, things can go pretty bad. Yes, yes, that's also true. I mean, unless you have something that helps you, yeah. yeah. So here the point is that you get a very good regularity because of the global setting in which you're setting the problem. I mean, you, you know that the full set uh, has finite volume and it's constantly in curvature global. And somehow this global property gives you a rigidity statement that makes the regularity simpler. I agree with that, yes. On the other hand, it could be that if you have almost constant mean curvature, or even locally, maybe you can say a bit better than uh, uh, this. I don't know. But maybe it's possible and could be interesting. Well, with stable, we can actually. That's yeah, yeah, okay. With stable, actually, yeah. With stable, but without that, I don't know. Could be probably. Okay. So this is the quantitative theorem with Chiraulo. And here, really, the, the interesting. Uh, problems that, I mean, I, I think they're interesting and I'm trying to understand them <coughs> since then, is how we improve on this kind of estimates. Because these kind of estimates are not sharp. So the power there is the same for all, all these problems? No, it's OK. In all the cases, it's got like uh, something uh, 1 over n. But uh, it may be that this one is a slightly better exponent than uh, this one, say. OK? And uh, I, the, in the proof, for example, you have to do things like, uh, so here this follows from Allard, which means that in the proof, uh, <coughs> we have to say that nearby here, we, qua we can relate the excess of area of the boundary of omega to the excess of area of g, that is as small as we want, it's just a matter of the scale. So we can relate the two excesses of area to the, oscillation, the global oscillation of the mean curvature to, make, to apply quantitatively Allard's theorem. Right? So that's the kind of stuff that is inside this theorem. So, and these are some sort of uh, calibration arguments, I would say. So, uh, so you control by this assumption, you control multiple sheets? Yes. Somehow. The, the, the assumptions that they're smooth, you mean? The mean curve. Ah, the mean curve, yes. Yeah. Yes. It tells you that away from that region, you converge just with one sheet. Sheets, no, you are a graph, indeed, yes. Yeah, exactly. I know that's the conclusion, but when you apply But that's what you have to prove, in a sense, because you have to prove that the local excess uh, is close to that of the limit. And we do that by somehow using the fact that the sphere is the sphere. I mean, it's, uh, so we can, we can find vector fields that somehow calibrate the exterior of the sphere. So in a sense, we know globally that the total perimeter is converging to the total perimeter. And then instead of showing that the perimeter in a ball is close to the perimeter of the sphere in the ball, we show that the perimeter outside of a ball of your set omega is more than the perimeter of this of the sphere outside of the same ball. And then uh, this is enough to get the excess inequality. It goes in the right direction. So there are a couple of funny things that happen down here. But uh, OK, let me, uh, let me tell you maybe uh, uh, something about the Alexander theorem revisited, how, where it comes from. And actually, I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thing to explain you because it allows me to show you one of the two proofs uh, of uh, the einstein karker inequality. So all these three, three theorems are based on a very uh, beautiful inequality called the einstein karker inequality. And uh, I know two proofs of this inequality. So proof number one that I will show you today is uh, inside this Alexander theorem revisited. Proof number two is inside the theorem two and theorem three. And they're pretty different proofs. One is a PD proof, uh, and the other one is really a geometric proof with uh, smart changes of variables and stuff like that. So I will show you the first proof of the einstein karker inequality, and then I will tell you how this proof creates you, gives you the starting point uh, for showing that every set of finite perimeter with constant mean curvature is a union of spheres. So um, let me maybe. <coughs> okay. So, 
So the Einstein-Karker inequality tells you that if you have a set with smooth boundary and finite volume, then, I'm sorry, and positive mean curvature. So you have, if you have a mean convex set of finite volume, then the volume of your set is less than n over n plus 1, which is the sharp constant, the integral over the boundary of omega of the inverse mean curvature. So this is a, this is a strange inequality, at least for me the first time I saw it, right? Because you divide by the mean curvature. And uh, in a sense, what this inequality is telling you that uh, a set with large mean curvature will have small volume. These are, uh, OK, let's see a, a, a bunch of trivial consequences of the inequality, right? If your mean curvature is everywhere very high, you will have small volume, which is, of course, reasonable. While if you have large volume, uh, in average, your mean curvature must, must be small. Okay, so these are two directions that this theorem. So it's a very useful inequality if you think about it in these terms, right? Because it's relating volume and mean curvature in an absolutely quantitative and non-trivial way. And uh, and actually, why is this related to Alexandrov? You can see it immediately, because if we have uh, constant mean curvature, we are in equality cases in Ansekarker, right? Because uh, so if uh, h of omega is constantly equal to a constant. Uh, then lambda is, cannot just be whatever it wants, as we know, right? It must be our special constant. Uh, and equality holds in Einstein-Karke, right? Because if I plug in this value of lambda, I, exactly, I have exactly what simplifies this number and gives me omega equal to omega. So if I can characterize the equality cases of Einstein-Karke and tells you that only both are equality cases, I'm proving Alexander's theorem without using the moving planes method. OK? So so proof one that is due, due to Montiel and Antonio Ross. So as, as I was telling you, proof number two is uh, related to these other theorems and is related to, uh, it is due to Antonio Ross too. And it uses the PDs, uses the torsion potential of your domain omega. So this one instead is purely geometric. So the way it goes is the following. We take the set omega, and uh, we consider the outer unit normal, nu of omega x. And we consider the parallel surfaces to right? So in which way? So we call gamma, why not? So we, it's just uh, the pairs x and t, such that x is in the boundary of omega, and t is less than the reciprocal of the largest curvature at x. So this is a sort of uh, cylinder above the boundary of omega. It's like uh, at each point, I look at the maximal curvature, I get 1 over that, and I got this graph, right? So. And why I'm interested in gamma is because omega is contained in psi of gamma, where psi, for the point in gamma, psi of xt is just x minus t, the normal of omega at x. So this is a very formal way of telling you this simple fact of life, that if you take a point y inside your domain omega, and this point, this point will touch the boundary of omega somewhere. OK? So let's say that he's touching it at my point x. So uh, the, the distance between y, so this means that in my picture, right, that y is equal to x minus u of y nu omega at x, where u of y will be the distance from the boundary of omega. So if I am in this picture, y is exactly that form. All right? And uh, what we have is that just by comparison, right, u of y uh, is related to the, so the radius of this ball, so n over u of y 
So the mean curvature at this point cannot be larger than this number. I mean, it can be more negative than in curvature, but it cannot be larger, right? So this will give me a bound on k max at x. So in particular, 1 over k max at x will be less than, uh, I'm not sure here about, no, this is not n. I don't need to compare, the, I really compare the curvatures, not the mean curvature. It's 1 over k max, so this is less than 1 over u of y. So definitely, uh, I can, uh, I did it the wrong way. Yes, it's the opposite inequality, luckily, because otherwise it would be a problem. So 1 over k max is larger than u of y. So it's definitely true that every point y can be reached by pushing t up to 1 over k max. Because if I push all the way up to 1 over k max, I definitely go beyond every point that projects over x. OK? So omega is definitely contained in this. Uh, so I'm kind of, it's a needle decomposition of omega. At each point, I shoot a needle. And the flatter the mean curvature, the longer the needle. Right? So here I have a point of I mean curvature. I'm shooting less because 1 over k is less. And I do this at every point. And so what I'm telling you is that this needle decomposition of omega covers all of omega. There will be overlappings, right? For example, I, these are points that are very flat, right? So for example, here, I expect to see a lot of, uh, of uh, overlapping, maybe, or maybe not, because the overlapping will happen probably in a set of measure 0. But uh, OK, let's not think too much about it and keep it like uh, it seems I have explained it well. So this is omega. It's contained in this map. And then <coughs> you can do the following argument. You can say, OK, the volume of omega just by containment is less than psi of gamma, simply because I have the containment of one into the other. So psi of gamma, I can integrate here h0, so the counting measure, of psi minus 1 of y in d y. So this is, so psi of gamma is the set in Rn plus 1 that I'm covering by this image. Maybe this set, it's even larger than omega. Eh? So think, for example, about this, this situation where omega is extremely flat down here. Okay. So here, my needles, and uh, so here, this will all be part uh, of psi of this gamma. Okay, so billions of points down there, a lot of volume, right? So I'm definitely wasting for a set that has a very flat face. I'm throwing away a lot. Uh, <coughs> this is less because, I don't know, maybe there is a quantity of positive volume of points that can be reached in many ways, right? Maybe, for example, my set down here does this. So here I have another flat part where my needles go like that. So here are all points that are in psi of gamma, where I have multiple, uh, uh, multiple pre-images. OK. This is the integral, actually, over gamma, my original set, of the Jacobian of the map psi, the tangential Jacobian of the map psi. Uh, over gamma, my measure is hn in the variable x, h1 in the variable t. Remember that gamma is the boundary of omega cross, is a cylinder, is containing the cylinder over gamma of omega. So it's the boundary of omega, and then I have this sort of roller coaster of a height 1 over k over it, right? So now I have to compute the Jacobian. But it's easy, eh? So remember that gamma is containing boundary of omega cross 0 infinity. So here, the tangent space to gamma will be the tangent space to the boundary of omega cross r. So here, I will have some tau i's. And here, I will have a unit vector e as my basis, right? So when I do the derivative along tau i of the map psi, that is x minus t the normal. So if I pick the tau i to be uh, principal directions, I have 1 minus t kappa i tau i. 
because I differentiate the identity and then I differentiate the normal. And then if I just take the derivative along the direction E of my map C, uh, psi, I get just minus the normal. Because differentiating in E means differentiating in T. Okay? So the Jacobian that I'm talking about will just be the modulus of the wedge product of all this stuff. And then you see quite simply tau i wedge nu omega, this is just an orthonormal basis over n plus 1, gives me 1. So all I have here is the product of 1 minus t kappa i. And see that I've taken out the, for i that goes from 1 to n, I've taken out the absolute value because t at most is 1 over k max, so it's always non negative. Okay? And it's exactly 0 when k i is equal to k max, uh, and I get t equal to 1 over k max. That's the, the tangential Jacobian of this map psi over gamma. That's what I have here. So this I can write it with Fubini as the integral over the boundary of omega, dh and x, of the integral between 0 and 1 over k max at x, of the product as 1 going from 1 to n of 1 minus t over t, uh, 1 minus t, kappa i of x. Where all these guys are non negative. So now, since they are non negative, and I have a product of non negative factors, and I do isoperimetric problems, I'm going to apply the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. Right? So that's the only proof we do. So, so here is the boundary of omega, dhn. Here is the integral between 0 and 1 over k max of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of what? Of 1 minus t kappa i divided by n and raised to the power n. OK? So without rewriting the integral, what is this thing? So this is. 1, because I have some i 1 over n of 1's, so I get 1 o n over n, 1, minus t, the mean curvature of the boundary divided by n to the power n. That's the actually what I am integrating down there. And about 1 over k max up here, since the mean curvature is the sum of the principal curvatures, this is always less than n over h of omega. So if now that I can throw away the geometric information I want to do so, I can just put over there n over h of omega. It's, not, it's just going to be more. I didn't want to do it before, because here I wanted these guys to be positive. I cannot do it uh, from the beginning. Okay? I have to do it later. OK, so now I have to compute. I hope I, 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 would, I, would, I will do it right in front of the cameras. I have to compute an integral. <laughs> so this is a very delicate moment. So this is the integral over the boundary of omega dhn, and here I have 0, n over h of omega, 1 minus t, h of omega over n to the power n. And so now this object here will be 1 over n plus 1, 1 minus t, h omega over n. So this is integrated in dt. Eh? That's why I know how to compute it. So this is n plus 1. Then I have n over h of omega that comes from the antiderivative in t. And then, since there is the minus, uh, I am computing this first in 0 and then in n over h omega. <coughs> and so when you plug in the, the two things, like in 0, we see, so this will be the integral over omega of n over n plus 1 times 1 over the mean curvature when I plug in 0. And when I plug this, I just see 0. So that's it. So that's how you prove the Ensecarker inequality in this paper of Muntiel and Ross. So what are the equality cases? Because we, we know that if the mean curvature is constant, as a bonus, you are an equality case for Ensecarker. And indeed, you get a lot of information. Because when you, when you go back to all this thing, right? You see that you have equality in the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, which tells you you are umbilical at every point uh, with positive mean curvature, so you are a sphere. 
So this is a theorem that tells you that Alexandrov theorem can follow directly from uh, the umbilicality theorem, the global umbilicality theorem, right? The one that tells you that you're either a sphere or a plane, if you are complete. Okay, so how does our proof really in five minutes to give you an idea of what goes on in this paper? How does our proof uh, build on that? Because you see, you now it's not that I can say, let me take a set of finite perimeter and change variables in my integral with the maximum of the mean curvature of my set. Okay? So, okay, so what do I know if omega is a set of finite perimeter, finite volume, constant mean curvature in very full sense? So, I definitely know the following things. I know that the reduced boundary of omega, which is, so I know that I can, first of all, I can normalize omega so that the topological boundary makes sense. Okay, this is a, this is a thing you can always do. You can always find the recipe to throw away points so that the topological boundary is as small as possible. Okay, so I can cook up things so that omega is open and the reduced boundary of omega, the topological boundary is the closure of the reduced boundary and actually, even better, they are HN equivalent. And in such a way that the reduced boundary of omega is uh, uh, analytic CMC. So like uh, using Allard regularity from the beginning of the story, I know that uh, I am better than I could have thought, because in a sense, the reduced boundary is analytic, it's a CMC. Now, what is, the, what is the difficulty of the theorem? The difficulty is that the, you, you could have countably many, you will have, in principle, countably many analytic surfaces joined into the boundary of this set through a compact uh, area zero set, okay? So you still have the regularity of the reduced boundary, but the way these CMC pieces are, are glued together is through some connecting compact set of zero area. But could be of fractional dimension, for what I know. Or not even that. Okay, could, could have even purely unrectifiable parts. I don't know. So it could be a total mess, right? So that's what makes it uh, uh, delicate. But uh, at least this insight you have from the regularity theory gives you a tiny bit of a starting point. Because it tells you that you can still ask yourself, okay, let me define gamma. So gamma will be the xt's such that x is in the reduced boundary of omega, and then t is less than 1 over k max at x. I mean, the reduced boundary is analytic now, so k max is well defined there. OK? So the map psi, I can define it exactly the same way using the outer unit normal to my set of finite perimeter. And then I will prove various things. So uh, so step one, I will need to show that omega is not exactly contained inside of gamma, but that modulo sets of, of area zero, volume zero, it's contained. So that's the first thing. So I want to be able to say, as I was doing up there, right? I have a ball, it touches, and so the curvatures are ordered, and then I know that this map is eating. Why? Because if I try to do the same, exactly the same argument here, you see, when I do the ball, I pick a point y in omega. I enlarge my ball until I touch the boundary. The point x at which I'm touching could be in the singular set here. So how do I know that the point y I am considering, when I project it back to the boundary, is projecting over a point in the reduced boundary, and therefore it's in the image of psi of gamma? Okay, so the first step will show, be showing that with probability one, you will pick one of those points. Probability one in the sense of volume. Then, in step two, you will realize that doing that, it's too much. <laughs> so you say, okay, I cannot prove step one. Okay, do it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? So the way you will really do this, you will say, okay, let me do something less ambitious. So you will first find a set omega star that is equivalent to omega. And actually, when you work on omega star, it becomes possible to prove the first property, OK? 
So this is not step one and step two. Uh, this is more like me remembering the proof on the spot. So, uh, so you don't exactly do that. It's not like you start picking points and estimating the measure of the points that project on the singular set. It's much more structured. So what we do is you say, let me go for some subset of omega that is still equivalent over which I have a chance of proving that. So let me tell you what is this omega star. Because I think the definition is interesting. So to get to my omega star, I will do the following uh, things. So I will call sigma of s the points y inside of omega <coughs> at distance s from the boundary of omega. So remember that u of y for me is the distance. Okay. So these are these can be in general these as finite h n measure. It's the boundary of a set of finite perimeter, but it's not even equal to its reduced boundaries. Just h n equivalent to the reduced boundary of the set where the distance is larger than s. It's a bad guy. It's compact. Then you look at sigma s t. So here s is positive. Now I pick t larger than s. And I look at a subset of this sigma s. So this will be the points y in omega such that y lies in a segment xz for x in the boundary of omega and z at distance t. So remember t larger than s. So these are all the points that are at distance s from the boundary of omega, but are actually in the ray, the projection ray of a point at distance t. So it's like boundary of omega, boundary of omega s, bound, uh, boundary of omega t. Here, omega s is the set where the distance is larger than s, right? So these, these points here are the points y that I can put on a segment like this. Not every point will have this property. Then I do sigma s plus will be the union over all the t larger than s of the sigma sts. So these are all the points at distance s that eventually will have somebody on their back, somebody at a slightly larger distance on their back. And I recover them all. I have absolutely no assurance that sigma s plus is all of sigma s. It won't be in general. It'll just be same area. So we'll be able to get everything but a set of measure 0. And then what is omega star? Omega star will be the union of all the sigma s pluses. Okay, this set is actually equivalent, and all of this without using the constant mean curve. This is true for every set of finite perimeter. So this sigma s, is, this omega tilde star, is equivalent to omega. Okay, and uh, I will be able to cover it with the psi of gammas. So. The key point uh, from the technical point of view, the boring point of the proof, uh, is showing that these guys are C11 rectifiable. And that the gradient of U has, uh, is tangentially differentiable along those sigma STs with all the bounds you expect on the derivatives coming from the interior exterior ball conditions you are imposing. OK. Once I have this thing, I can repeat the proof of Montiel and Ross and claim that I have an equality case. The fact that I have an equality case will tell me that uh, the boundary of my set consists of countably many pieces of spheres of equal radii. Once I will be in that position, countably many pieces of spheres of equal radii, I can use, but it will tell me more. If you remember the proof at a certain point, I had an inequality counting how many counter images I had. Now I know that for almost every point, the counter images are unique. So I will use this information and the fact that I have countably many pieces of sphere and a geometric argument to say that each piece of sphere is actually a full sphere. So by finite perimeter, you have finitely many, and you are a union spheres. So that's how the proof works. Uh, and just one very last thing, the really delicate argument is this one. It's showing that with this map, you get everything. And then uh, the way we do that is because essentially, if 
you look at all the points, the good points in the sense of this set, all the good points that project back to the singular set. And you can show that those bad points that project back to the singular set are negligible by using the maximum principle for very false of uh, Schätzle. So we use that theorem and the geometric construction showing that we can apply it, the strong maximum principle, to exclude those points. OK, I say this, I apologize, I said about the proof only because I was told that I should have been talking about proofs a bit. So I, I, I understand that at 5 PM, this must be horrible. So I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>